Here we go. So that's the session just on record now. Um, and yeah, we're just starting to get people in the session. That's good. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, Rebecca, would you like me to share my uh, first slide to show a bit of a introduction as to what we're going to cover? Yes, please. Thank you. Yep, so I can see we've got about 20 people joining so far, so um, we can roughly know what numbers we're expecting tonight. So we'll just give it a few more minutes um, to let everyone join since we're kind of a wee bit ahead of time. And in the meantime, we've got that slides working in Eloise, um, so hopefully everybody can see that um, that are joining. So this just gives a little bit of an overview of what we're going to be um, speaking about this evening. So yep, welcome to our final webinar in our uh, Dive into Scotland's Living Seas series. So um, yep, it's been a great few weeks um, with lots of different speakers, obviously on different topics. So maybe you're joining us from another webinar that you've been to. Um, but tonight we have uh, Dr. Carol Sparling and uh, Kate Weston to talk about marine mammals. Um, so we'll have three and we'll, we'll have Eloise as well from the Living Seas team. Um, so yeah, three different speakers for tonight. Um, yeah, still got a few more people joining, so that's great. Yep, just while we have people joining, we'll just go through a few things for uh, tonight's uh, talks. So um, the webinar tonight is being recorded um, and it'll be uploaded to the Trust YouTube channel. And um, we'll also have a link at the end as well, just to signpost you to the playlist on our YouTube channel where you can watch all of the previous webinars as well. Um, and then this one will be available soon too. Um, please uh, do not open any links in the chat box that have been shared by people other than the speakers and um, this is just you know a kind of digital safeguarding uh point so yeah only open links that have been sent by one of the speakers for tonight um you have a few different options um along the toolbar on zoom um that we'll be using tonight so you have a q a button um where you can add any questions that you have for the speakers and um, so you can be doing that during the talks um and then we will get to them at the end um, during the Q&A section. Um, you can indicate if it's for a specific speaker um, or if it's just for everybody and we'll just open that up at the end. Um, and then you can also uh, like or vote for a, a question if you, you know, want that one to really want that one to be answered. You can thumbs that up and we'll get to those, um, as I say, at the end. Um, you can also use the chat box just to share comments throughout this, uh, the talks um, and using the reactions tab as well to thumbs up or, um, you know, do a little wow emoji for some really great pictures. Um, and you can also use the closed caption box as well, which will um, uh, create live captions for you as well. Um, and we'll also have links going into the chat box as well throughout um, where you'll be signposted to um, specific things that the speakers are talking about as well. Are we happy to think Eloise just to start? I'm not seeing many more people joining in the last minute or so. Um, we happy to just get started a little bit early? Yeah, I think the earlier yeah. we start, the more time we have for questions. Yep. Sounds good. Um, so I'll introduce our first speaker for this evening. So first up, we have Dr. Carol Sparling from the Sea Mammal Research uh, Unit that's based at the University of St Andrews. Um, so she'll be taking us through looking at um, interactions between grey seals and marine mammals and also um, a bit about East Coast bottlenose dolphin uh, populations as well. So um, if you would like to take it away, Carol. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. I'll just share my screen. Now, can someone just let me know if they can see the slide? Yes, we can. Brilliant. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So I don't have a huge amount of time. I think I've got 10 minutes to speak. So I'm going to concentrate on three of our most common and beloved stars of the Scottish marine mammal scene. And these are also three of the species that are most likely to be seen by people out and about around our coasts. They're also the three species that we at the Sea Mammal Research Unit focus a lot of our research and monitoring work on. So firstly, we've got the grey seal, which is our largest and the most populous of our two native seal species. And then secondly, thus our smaller um, of the two seals, the harbour or sometimes known as the common seal. And thirdly, I'll talk about our resident bottlenose dolphin population. And I'm also going to highlight some projects that you can get involved in by sending us your observations to help increase our understanding of these amazing animals. Firstly, our iconic grey seals. Grey seals are, are a real conservation success story. Since seal culling and commercial hunting was banned in the 1970s, Scottish populations have increased dramatically. Approximately 35% of the world's grey seals breed in the UK, and 80% of these breed at colonies in Scotland. At the Sea Mammal Research Unit, we monitor the grey seal population by carrying out aerial surveys of the main breeding colonies. And we take digital photographs from the air and count the number of pups in the photographs. And the main colonies across the UK are surveyed in this way, roughly every two to three years. This map shows the location of most of the grey seal breeding colonies around the UK. And over 90% of pups are born at the coloured colonies. And we can see that in the populations on the west coast of Scotland um, and in the north coast in Orkney, numbers of seals have stabilised over time after periods of rapid increase. And this is probably because those populations have reached the limit of the number of animals that the current environmental conditions can support. But if we look on the east coast, populations are still increasing. And our most recently established colonies down in the southeast of England, still increasing at as much as 16% per year. So as I said, a real, a real success story for grey seals. And so moving on to our harbour seals, they're smaller and much less common, despite the fact that they're often called common seals. And their fortunes of late has not been as positive as those of grey seals. Scotland holds approximately 85% of the UK harbour seal population, and the UK population is about 30% of the total European population. And unlike grey seals, where we count the pups that are visible because of their white coats when we survey them, with harbour seals, we count adult seals during the molt in August, which is the time of year when they're most likely to be ashore when they come ashore to molt their fur and grow a new coat. We survey these using a variety of methods, depending on the habitat. But on rocky shores like this one, it's really tricky to see seals which are well camouflaged. So we use a hel helicopter in these cases with a thermal imaging camera. This is an example that shows how well the thermal imager can work in good conditions. It's unlikely that we'd spot these seals, which are the white blobs in the image, without that thermal, thermal image to help us. This map shows the most recent counts available for the UK for harbour seals. Um, and these, are from, these data come from surveys up to 2021. And we can see a bit of an east-west divide. In the Western Islands, in the west and southwest coasts of Scotland, we see that numbers are generally increasing. However, in the Northern Isles and the East Coast, the harbour seals are not doing quite so well with sub substantial declines having occurred in recent times. And even in the southeast of England, which was an area where seals were increasing until very recently, we're now starting to see numbers decline there as well. The big question for us is what's causing these declines? Now, I'm afraid we don't have, um, we don't have the answer to that yet. A large number of candidate um, reasons have been suggested, some from human causes, but also some from natural causes as well. Now, it's unlikely that there's one single factor that would explain all the declines across all of these regions. Um, but several factors we have been able to reject as primary causes of the decline based on the available evidence, at least in Scotland, as we're only just starting our research um, on the population in England. So we're currently investigating a number of these factors, including reduction in prey availability, competition with grey seals for prey resources, predation by grey seals, and predation by killer whales, and also exposure to disease and exposure to toxins from harmful algal blooms. 
And the best place to go and read about the results of this work as it progresses is in our SCOS reports, which stands for Special Committee on Seals. We report annually um, using these reports on all of our work. They're all available on our website and the link for that should be being shared um, in the chat. Now I'm gonna go on and give a couple of examples of ongoing projects that you can go and find out more about and even contribute to our research. And these projects are focused on the direct interactions of harbour seals with other species. So the first of these, I'm not gonna go into in any detail, but it's, it's called the EcoPreds project. So please do go out, go and check out the website to find out more. This work is specifically focusing on the nature and extent of killer whale predation on seals. And it's concentrating on observations and data from the Northern Isles of Scotland and mainly in Shetland. Um, and again, the link um, for that project site should be available for you to go and check out. The second project I want to talk about is called the, the, the Seal Cred Project. And this is investigating grey seal predation on other marine mammals, including harbour seals, but also juvenile grey seals and harbour porpoises. Now, since 2010, a concerted effort has been made to collect data on marine mammal, on, on dead marine mammals that have been washing up around the, the UK with very unusual spiral lacerations, so-called corkscrew seals. The first confirmed observation that this was um, occurring because of grey seals predating on, on, on other seals was observed in Germany in 2013. And then a year later, an adult male grey seal was observed killing and partially consuming Wean grey pups, uh, wean grey seal pups at the Isle of May. And the unusual spiral lacerations were very evident from these events. So one of the aims of this project is to quantify the extent of grey seal predation and to explore whether this could be sufficient to explain the harbour seal decline in some areas. And this project provides an opportunity for anyone who's witnessed grey seal behaviour, which could be linked to marine mammal predation, to report this information to us via an, an online form. So when we combine information from the Strandings Network and from submissions of observations from members of the public, we actually essentially get eyes and surveyors all around the, the, the coastline. So we're asking people to submit a description of the event, as well as any images or videos that were taken at the time. Now, as a result of contributions from members of the public, we're building up a catalogue of known grey seal predators in regions around the UK. And this is helping us to work out how much predation is occurring. In the first of fourth, for example, we've been able to confidently identify four different male grey seal individuals that are responsible for this behaviour. The third species I want to talk about is the bottlenose dolphin. In Scotland, we have the most northerly population of bottlenose dolphins anywhere in the world. We've been working with our colleagues at Aberdeen University's Lighthouse Field Station since the 1990s to monitor this population on the east coast of Scotland. And there's a photo identification project that's been going on since 1990. A photo ID survey will involve us going out in a small boat and taking photographs of as many individuals as possible when a group is encountered. And we can identify and track individuals from their fin shapes and patterns. And this also allows us to estimate the size of the population. Marked on this map, you'll see the Maury Firth Special Area of Conservation, which was designated in 2005 as it was the core area used by the dolphin population at the time. However, since then, we've seen a range expansion with dolphins now being seen regularly outside of this area. And in the last few years, this range expansion has been continuing with regular sightings of dolphins all the way down the coast, southeast of England and, and, and down into England as well. We can't cover all of this area with our systematic photo ID surveys. So this led us to set up the Citizen Fins project. And this launched in September 2020 to collect citizen, citizen science photo ID data in Southeast Scotland and in, in England to get a better understanding of movements of animals across the range between Scotland and England and even further afield. So people can go to the Citizen Fins website, to submit photos and GPS data which our team will then process and will always provide feedback on any successful matches that we get to our catalogue. The project's now been running for over two years and we've had an incredible response. Over 200 dolphin encounters have been logged um, from Northern Scotland to East Yorkshire with nearly two and a half thousand photos. So what do we get from this information? Well, we can see that the population are really continuing to expand southwards and using the southern parts of their range. 
And it's also worth highlighting that there are efforts all around UK and Scottish coasts to develop these photo ID catalogues and sharing information and, and images between these catalogues can allow us to determine how much long range movement and exchange there is between different areas. An example of this on the screen is, is the Clyde Whale and Dolphin Watch Photo ID project. We're also learning about longer range movements of individuals that we regularly encounter in the survey area. So this example here is Singers, who's actually number one in our catalogue who we first saw in 1989. So Singers is at least 34 years old, probably older. And in 2021, this dolphin was seen in June, July and August, by both um, Citizen Finns contributors and in smooth surveys around the Tay and the Firth of Forth. In early September, Singers was seen up in the Murray Firth by the Lighthouse surveys. And then Singers was seen in September, um, off the coast of Scarborough. And fast forward to 2022, we've got the first reported sighting again in East Yorkshire in July, and then Singers was sighted back in the Moray Firth in early August, and then back in the Tay a week later. Now this kind of knowledge is absolutely invaluable to help us to protect these animals and identify the areas which need protection. And our ability to do this is greatly enhanced because of the contributions from citizen science. And I know that you're going to hear a lot more about citizen science and the value that it can bring um, from our next speaker. Um, so I think it just leaves it for me to say thank you for listening. Um, um, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Thank you very much. I'll just stop sharing now. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, so we've been posting some uh, links into the, the chat there and um, lots of fantastic opportunities for people to be able to feed into uh, research and science around seals and marine mammals, um, which leads us quite well onto our uh, poll, actually. So I should have mentioned at the start that um, we do have uh, some polls tonight to ask a couple of questions uh, of you. Um, first one being on citizen science. Um, so this will follow on into Kate's talk as well. So do you believe citizen science is a valuable tool to help protect wildlife? Um, so we have no, unsure and yes. Uh, so feel free to, to choose your answer um, and we'll share the results of that shortly. Um, we are still moving, so we'll maybe give it a few more, a few more seconds or so. Okay, doc. It looks like it stopped just now, so I can end it there. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> so we have 100% yes, uh, citizen science is a valuable uh, tool to help protect wildlife. Thank you very much, everybody, for voting. Um, so we'll move on to our next speaker. Um, so I'd like to welcome uh, Kate Weston, who is uh, Ocean Conservationist Coordinator at ORCA, um, which is a charity that's dedicated to studying and protecting whales, dolphins and porpoises in UK and European waters. Um, so I will pass on to you, uh, Kate. And again, just to say, if people have any questions for speakers, do feel free to pop it into the Q&A section um, on the toolbar there for answering later. Um, and yeah, on to you, Kate. Thing. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Let's just get this set up. Hopefully you can see my screen. Yep, looks good. Yeah, fabulous. Um, well, it sounds like I've got a bit of an easy job, to be honest, if you've all um, already believe in the power of citizen science, which is absolutely amazing um, to hear. But during these 10 minutes, I would just like to give you a bit of an introduction into ORCA, who we are as a charity and how we're working to help protect whales and dolphins um, from the unfortunate many threats that they face. She says clicking the next slide. There we go. Um, so you've probably already guessed that Orca are a whale and dolphin conservation charity. Uh, we're dedicated to the long term protection of whales, dolphins and porpoises and their habitats. And um, these group of animals are collectively known as cetaceans. Now, it's important to remember that cetaceans are, of course, marine mammals. That means they breathe air, they give birth to live young and they suckle their young. So Orca as a charity, well, our vision is oceans alive with whales and dolphins. And our mission is quite simply to give everyone who cares about whales and dolphins an active role in safeguarding their future. 
Orca were founded in 2001 and we actually operate globally and we have a few different programs that cover all oceans. Um, so we've covered the Arctic, Atlantic, Pacific, Southern and excitingly we now cover the Indian Ocean as well. But of course, we have a really rich history of working with the wonderful wildlife in Scotland um, and a main focus area for us has been working in the Hebrides with companies such as Caledonian McBrain on their ferries routes, as well as a number of different cruise operators such as Fred Olsen, Ambassador and Hurtigruten Expeditions. We're also really exciting that our work with Northlink will once again be up and running this year after a little hiatus um, over the past couple of years. And I'm sure none of you can guess what caused that. Um, so Scotland is a really important area for us because there's more than 20 different species of cetacean that have been sighted in Scottish waters. Now, some of those are really common species um, or more common species like our lovely bottlenose dolphins that Carol just talked about or harbour porpoise um, to things like the unmistakable orca or killer whale. So you are always really in for a treat when you take your binoculars to Scottish waters. And what we're doing um, in these areas to help protect the wonderful whales, dolphins and porpoises that call Scotland home is can be broken down into three key programme areas. The first of which is inspiring people about the wonders of cetaceans. And in fact, Orca's work is actually as much about people as it is about cetaceans. We really truly believe in the power of people and that education is key to conservation success. Through educating the public, we can achieve real change in how people interact with the marine environment and we can in also educate uh, industries, so the cruise, ferry and freight operators that we work with and make the marine environment a safer place for whales and dolphins. The second part of our work is saving cetaceans through citizen science. So like I said, people are absolutely at the heart of what we do and we would never be able to achieve our mission of, to give everyone who cares about whales and dolphins active role in safeguarding their future if we didn't put people at the heart of our research. So through our highly trained citizen scientists, we are able to monitor populations and collect data on population health. And that leads us into our third area of work, which is creating policy chains for cetacean conservation. And this is because we have these really big, robust data sets that we can use to influence policy, which ultimately is what allows us to put in these long term protections for whales, dolphins and porpoises. So with those three key programme areas in mind, I'll just take you through um, some of that in a little more detail. So the first area of work is my kind of key area, which is the Ocean Conservationist Programme. And Orca are really proud that we have an amazing team of trained conservation professionals who you can find on board ferries and cruises all over the world. And our ocean conservationists are at the heart of our work of inspiring people. And this is what we really look for when we're recruiting our ocean conservationists, that passion and that drive to help whales and dolphins and the marine environment. Because our ocean conservationists will meet hundreds, if not thousands of people across the ferry and cruise ships we work on in a year. But no matter where they meet them, a key part of their role is to help people appreciate the wonderful whales and dolphins. So we, you will find them on board giving lectures, workshops and running deck watches to help you spot whales and dolphins and to teach you about their threats. So if you come across our ocean conservationists in the Hebrides, for example, they might be talking to you about key threats like ship strike or bycatch. And we really think it's important not to shy away from these topics because people can't help what they don't know. And by that, I mean, you know, if you don't know about a problem, you, you can't do anything to change it. So by having ocean conservationists on board, we are making a real impact in what people can change in their day to day lives. And tourism is a big part of this. So we might be talking in places where whaling is still happening or captivity. But in Scotland, we might be talking more about things like bycatch or responsible whale watching. I'm really giving tourists those key information to think about what impact are their choices having and showing them how their choices can make a huge difference to the health of our oceans. But of course, fundamentally, Orca are a scientific charity based on data collection. So our ocean conservationists, not only are there to educate and inspire people, but to collect that all important scientific data that helps drive our policy change. And like I said, there's about 20 different species of cetacean in the Hebrides, so it's a really, really exciting place for our ocean conservationists to go. We don't just pick places to go because they're pretty, and of course Scotland is an absolutely beautiful country and we're all always thrilled to go there. 
but we pick it because it's got this rich marine life. We're thinking about things like, well, how important is this area for whales and dolphins? Is it a known hotspot? Are we data deficient in that area? Do the populations there need monitoring because of, particu of a particular threat? Are there particular activities happening in that time of year? Do they already have protection in place and do we need to monitor them to check that these protections are still effective? The ultimate aim with our data is to identify new hotspots and to monitor existing hotspots so these highly mobile animals can continue to thrive in these areas. And this is where our wonderful Ocean Watchers app comes into play. So this is a bespoke data collection app that you can have on your mobile phone. It has three main functions, so survey at sea, survey on land, and I spy at sea. So as long as you can see the ocean, you can collect data. And this app is amazing because it's not just used by our amazing ocean conservationists, but it can be used by you. If you would like to become a citizen scientist, you can download this app and start collecting data. Now, the survey at sea and survey at land uh, on land functions are pretty similar, apart from the obvious that on one you need to be on water and the other you need to be near water to complete them. And the data that you'll collect is broken down into two key categories. We collect what we call effort-based data and this is, means that we're collecting environmental uh, data which includes information on where you're watching from and the conditions you're watching in. So just humour for me for a moment and picture your perfect day at sea. I think most of us are probably picturing mirror calm conditions, hardly any swell, maybe even a little sunshine, although if you're in Scotland, there's probably always a cloud or two, and I'm allowed to say that because I'm from Wales and it rains all the time there. Um, but these conditions are going to make it relatively easy to see animals in the water. So from the incredible fin whales that you might see in Scotland, the second largest animal on the planet, to charismatic common dolphins jumping around on the surface, you'll even probably quite easily track harbour porpoises as they kind of plop, plop, plop through the surface in those mirror calm conditions. But picture a day where the weather's a bit less forgiving, the swell is quite big, you have lots of white caps to uh, argue with, it gets a lot more difficult to spot animals. So we collect effort data. So our wonderful resident data wizard, Ellie at the office can do all sorts of amazing statistics with it and tell us the likelihood of us missing animals. Then of course, we're collecting data on the animals we see, how many of them there are, their behavior, whether there's any calves. And this gives us vital information on what the animals are doing and how they're using the environment. And if you're not quite ready to delve into the world of citizen science yet, you can use our I Spy at Sea function, which is essentially a lighter version of the app, where you can still collect data, but instead of identifying to species level, you will just identify whales, dolphins and porpoises. This really, really nice introduction to the power of citizen science. And it would be a miss for me to mention citizen science and the work of Orca without mentioning our wonderful marine mammal surveyors. So our marine mammal surveyors are what gives Orca the gold standard of citizen science data. These are highly trained individuals um, who go on dedicated surveys to collect sightings data. So they're slightly different from our ocean conservationists because they will spend their whole survey up on the bridge. They will be in a team of four and they will collect uh, distance sampling data. Um, you can also train to be a marine mammal surveyor if you like, although we do tend to do these trainings later in the year. So our next trainings for the marine mammal surveyors start in November. And this is just so we can get people up and running for the season ahead, ready to start sort of our distance sampling um, season is kicking off right about now. And you can see all about that on our socials. So how do we use citizen science data? It's all well and good collecting data, but there's no point collecting it for the sake of it. Well, something that we've done in Scotland is habitat modelling for common dolphin distribution, because what we were seeing was that there was a trend that common dolphin numbers were increasing over time. And from our citizen science data, we saw that between 2017 and 2018, there was a 59% increase in the number of common dolphins in the area. But between 2018 and 2019, there was a staggering 192% increase in the amount of common dolphins we were seeing. And you can read about this more in our State of European Cetaceans report. But this was all data that we were able to, um, to come um, together with because of our wonderful sense and sciences. We use this data for policy change and to put marine protected areas in place. And this has been instrumental in places like Scotland, where you have your wonderful marine protected areas around the Hebrides. 
And actually, citizen science data contributed to 90% of the data for these marine protected areas. And a huge amount of that was contributed by ORCA and our wonderful citizen science. And of course, that we have our continuous data set. So we've been a charity since the early 2000s, and this means that we are getting that continual data coming in. We can continue to monitor populations. This map here just shows a little um, transect data from some of our work with CalMAC. And you can see our ocean conservationists last year saw an amazing 704 animals, most of those common dolphins, um, with the second highest being harbor porpoise. And our marine mammal surveyors had a very similar um, thread here, most common species, common dolphins and harbour porpoise. And again, you can read about this in a bit more detail in our state of European cetaceans. Unfortunately, there is a reason why we're working in Scotland and it's not just to see the wonderful whales and dolphins. I know um, Eloise is going to talk a bit more about threats. But we are here because there are a number of different threats that are affecting our wonderful whales and dolphins, and we want to monitor them um, to make sure that these threats aren't too detrimental. Because whales and dolphins are important to us, not just because they're beautiful, but because they're ecosystem engineers. They bring nutrients from the depths where they feed up to the surface. They bring phytoplankton blooms, which ultimately captures carbon and will help us in our fight against climate change. So. Although whales and dolphins are beautiful to look at, the picture is so, so much bigger than this, and we need them in order to protect our oceans. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of a flavour into ORCA, how we work, and how valuable citizen science really is um, to help protect these wonderful species and our oceans as a whole. You can train as an or or ORCA ocean watchers. Our next trainings are happening in April and May, and you can find more information about that on our website. Um, and we really hope that you will join us in giving everyone who cares about whales and dolphins an active role in safeguarding their future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Again, just some really fantastic ways of getting involved in uh, whale and dolphin conservation. You shall, you'll find uh, some links in the chat there um, to signpost you to some of the things that Kate was uh, talking about. I'll definitely be downloading that app. Um, I'm on the ferry between Orkney and Caithness quite a lot, and usually the visibility is so poor. It's All I can say is that I've seen a marine mammal, but not what. So it's good that you can, you can just record that you've seen something yeah. <laughs> if you can't identify it. Um, that's great. So I think we will move on to uh, our next poll. Um, if you're ready, Eloise. So we're going to be looking at um, threats to marine mammals next in Eloise's talk. So ahead of that, we're looking at what you think represent the greatest threat to marine mammals. So we have a few options there um, for you to choose from um, in terms of the greatest threat. So climate change, harassment and disturbance, fishing and aquaculture, invasive species, marine traffic, uh, offshore developments like wind and wave energy, oil and gas, and then also pollution. So that could be chemical, uh, marine litter or underwater noise as well. So we'll give a bit of time for people to go through those and pick what you think is the greatest threat currently facing marine mammals. Yes, yeah, so yeah, people are voting fast, we're getting there. It's an interesting one, though, isn't it? When you have to pick just one threat, mm -hmm. um, the one that you think is the most important, um, you know, we all know that it's often the cumulative impacts of all these threats interacting together that cause some of the biggest problems. Okay, it looks like everyone has answered now, so I can share that here. Okay, so we have, by the looks of it, pollution um, and fishing and aquaculture have been voted the most, so 39%, 35%, um, and then votes split amongst the other ones. Nobody's chosen invasive species. Um, yeah, that's great. Thank you very much, everyone, for voting. Um, so that leads us really nicely into Eloise's talk. So Eloise is the Living Seas Engagement Officer at the Scottish Wildlife Trust. Um, and she's going to be talking to us, us this evening about some of the threats that marine mammals are currently facing um, in Scotland's waters. So I'll hand over to you, Eloise. Thank you, Rebecca. Here we go. Can everyone see my screen? Yep, that looks good to me. 
good stuff. All right, so um, just to give you a quick introduction to um, the Living Seas team at the Scottish Wildlife Trust. So um, we have three individuals in our team and um, you've met two of us already. So um, there's myself, I'm the engagement officer, and um, my colleague Rebecca, who's our host today, and also our project manager, Jess, who is very busy in the background coordinating a lot of the admins. So thank you, Jess. Um, so at the Living Seas team in the Scottish Wildlife Trust, we focus on two key areas of work. So we have our policy and advocacy work, and we also have our community engagement work. And importantly, we're always exploring the areas that these two intersect. So we work closely with everyone from government to industry, academics, uh, lots of key stakeholders like the public, coastal community groups, uh, to ensure that marine ecosystem health is a priority in all decisions. And to find out more, you can check our website. So some threats to marine mammals. We do not have a lot of time, as I'm sure you're well aware. Um, we could definitely talk about each of these things um, you know, in, in a whole webinar. Um, and you can see here that I've just said some threats to marine mammals. They're far, far more than this. But today, what I wanted to do in the short time we have is to focus on those that I think um, would interest you um, in terms of, you know, you being able to do something about that threat. Um, so we'll kind of whirl through these as best we can. Um, and as Rebecca said, if you have questions as we go, please pop them in the Q&A box. Okay, so we have um, harassment and disturbance. So um, here we're going to, you know, talk about, of course, people deliberately. Um, har harassment, sorry, is, sounds quite deliberate, doesn't it? Um, disturbance can be um, sort of causing a disruption to the behaviour of a marine mammal um, inadvertently. Um, but basically what we're saying is we're disturbing their natural behaviours. Um, so I just wanted to really highlight um, some best practice around this. Now, this is something that you can do as an individual. Um, it's also something that you can look out for when you're on the water. Um, perhaps if you're out on a um, sort of ecotourism trip or you're um, you know, on a ferry or whatever else it might be. Um, and I would always advise that you look at things like we have the Scottish Marine Wildlife Watching Code, um, which is on the website for Nature Scope. So it has much more information, but some really good things to look out for. Um, first off, you'll see this WISE logo down the bottom. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the WISE scheme, then I actually recommend you listen to the first webinar in this series, which was about basking sharks, because um, the director of the WISE programme was one of our guest speakers, um, and he talked a lot about the programme and how important it is. But basically what it is, it's the UK's national training scheme for minimising disturbance to marine wildlife. So the first instance, uh, you can definitely look out for this logo um, because it is a really good sign that they are a responsible operator. Um, so as you can see, we've got some good things to do here. So we've got things like, um, if you do see a marine mammal, please slow down um, to the, safe, the safest sort of minimum speed that you can manage. Um, keep your distance. So um, if the animal decides to approach you, then that's very much on their terms. Do not crowd them. And there's this lovely diagram you can see here, which really shows that this no-go zone, which is really, really important to maintain um, and the distance you should keep. So um, on the approach, um, you know, make sure that your movements are steady and predictable. You're not doing anything sort of that's going to startle um, or the animal or maybe cut it off. Um, don't approach directly from behind or directly from in front. Um, if you're moving along with the animal, if the animal's traveling parallel to you, then you can maintain a steady speed. Um, but otherwise, um, it would be a case of, you know, looking at the arrows in this diagram saying from an angle um, is always the best way. Uh, don't overstay your welcome. So um, don't crowd the animal, don't hang about for too long. And um, you can see some advice here about sort of 30 minutes tops. Um, and, you know, if there's more than one uh, ship around, then, you know, you're really halving that time. And if you do see signs of disturbance, please do move on. So it's important to look out for any potential sudden movements, uh, aggressive behaviour could be um, sort of popping their heads up, tail slaps, vocalisations, maybe bunching together. Um, if you see any of that, please, please do move away. Um, so talking about fisheries um, and sort of fishing impacts. So I wanted to highlight some facts here. So these have been pulled from the UK Fisheries Audit, which was in 2021. So this showed us that six out of 10 of the UK's most important fish stocks 
are overfished or in a critical situation. So essentially what we're doing is we are taking too much fish from our seas, but importantly, we're taking too much of certain species from our seas as well. Um, and this, of course, has huge implications for lots of marine life that, um, you know, uh, rely on those species and it can cause huge imbalances in food chains. Um, of the 104 UK fish stocks that were audited, actually only 36% were known to be healthy, um, which is quite scary, to be honest. So um, as an individual, one thing that you can really do to make sure that you are being as responsible as possible is try and find sustainably sourced fish. Now, you might think, you know, how on earth did I do that? That sounds really, really difficult and complex. Well, we would recommend looking to our friends at the uh, Marine Conservation Society. They have the Good Fish Guide, and this is a guide that's published every year, and it showcases some fantastic um, species to look out for and um, that, that are good to take, and also those that you should avoid as well. Um, so you can find it online, and you can even get it, and you can even ask to get little uh, handouts, little pamphlets sent to you as well. Um, so we have fishing practices. I just wanted to highlight some of these with you. Um, you might be familiar with these already. Um, so some of the things that we do when we are looking to catch fish, uh, so trawling. Trawling essentially is using a large bag. It's held open and, you know, the vessel drags it through the water. Um, it can be deep sea trawling as well, which is right on the seabed. Um, you'll get gill nets as well. So basically gill net fishing uses a net wall and it has a floating line um, along the top and a lead line along the bottom. Um, so you can see it standing vertically. Then you have things like a long line. So that's the main line and at intervals, um, there's a series of short lines called snoots um, and they're baited. And then you've got a hand line, which is kind of probably what you think of when you think of like recreational fishing. So um, with a line and a pole. Um, so just some of that terminology, it's useful to know. Um, and I'm sure you can see some of the problems this causes for marine mammals um, in terms of bycatch and entanglement. So bycatch is basically the accidental, the incidental capture of non-target species. So basically that means it's when fisheries catch the species that they don't mean to catch. Okay, the net is out there. Um, of course, they can't just catch the species they're looking for. They'll pick up other things as well. Um, so that does include marine mammals. Um, it also includes seabirds um, and lots and lots of other species as well. Um, so talking about cetaceans in particular, we know that actually bycatch kills over 300,000 cetaceans every year, um, which is quite a scary fact. And thinking of entanglement, that's actually different to bycatch because um, they're not actually brought onto the ship. Entanglement is when uh, animals will become tangled up in perhaps fishing nets and things like that that remain in the water. So like ghost nets um, and unused discarded equipment. So you might think, you know, what can I do? Um, you know, this is such a big issue. I don't work at sea. Um, so some things that we've just talked about already is in terms of fish, um, you know, if you can, if you find that it does, it is some a choice you can make in your life to cut back a bit, maybe eat less. And then, you know, yeah, please explore that. But um, we would say that the most important thing is to make sure the fish you do take is sustainably sourced. Um, things like litter picks and beach cleans are fantastic. Um, you do not have to do this along the beach if you do not live near the coast. We know that um, most of the pollution, the litter that ends up in the sea comes from land. So even cleaning things up around your local park, along your river is gonna make a big difference. Um, and yeah, and supporting advocacy actions, which we'll talk about in our next slide. Um, habitat destruction and modification. So um, we know that there's a lot going on at sea just now, right? So um, we've got a huge amount of offshore development happening. We've got big, big targets that the government has set in terms of offshore renewables, you know, your um, uh, offshore wind farms and wave energy. Um, so the sea is a very busy place. And whilst marine mammals, they're adapted to use sound for a variety of uh, reasons, you know, to communicate, to find food, um, to mate, um, to socialize. Um, we know that actually they are very severely impacted by human activities and human noise. Um, and there's a few kind of sounds to look out for. So we tend to break it down into two categories. We have impulsive noise. So impulsive noise is your loud one-off sounds. Um, it could be, for example, a seismic gun, 
uh, you know, sort of pile driving for oil and gas, um, underwater blasting, detonation of unexploded uh, ordnance devices, things like that. And then you've got your non-impulsive noise or continuous noise. And that's a noise that, as you can imagine, is happening consistently. Um, and that could be things such as shipping that causes uh, these problems. And oh, I'm not sure if you can hear this, actually. Um, I can maybe explore kind of playing that later. Um, but there's a few little noise clips that I can maybe come back to. But in terms of impacts that the, this has on the species, so um, we know that it can cause mass strandings. Um, this is actually a picture of a sci whale, unfortunately, that's stranded. Um, and you can see someone's uh, doing a bit of a survey to sort of figure out what's happened. Um, it can cause behavioural changes. Um, it can impact migration routes, uh, feeding behaviours, nursing behaviours, um, important uh, times when they need to rest. Um, it can cause animals to um, change the way that they move through the environment. Um, often might, what might happen, for example, with sonar is that uh, deep diving animals will suddenly want to get away from the noise. So they will rise very quickly to the surface. Um, and, you know, as, as Kate explained, they're mammals. Um, and, you know, by doing that, it causes a huge pressure imbalance in their bodies. Um, and it can lead to, a, you know, sort of problems internally, physiologically, that can cause strandings as well. Um, and these noises can cause masking as well, which means it's harder. It, it masks the ability for them to actually express their own noise and hear other things in their environment. And um, so they can become more susceptible to things like predators and um, they can find it harder to find other individuals um, in their populations and things like that. So I realize this is quite a heavy topic. What can I do? OK, noise pollution, such a big, such a big problem. Um, we would love to um, your support in helping create ocean recovery zones. So we have an e-action that's live just now um, that's been put together um, through Scotlink. So basically what you can do is sign this e-action. And what we'd like to do is basically ask Environment Minister Mary McAllen to create highly protected marine areas. These would ban all damaging activities from at least 10% of Scotland's seas. We really want to showcase public support for this. So all it would take is just a quick e-signature and maybe sharing that with some friends and family. We would so appreciate it. We currently have 1,186 signatures, and I definitely think that we can get more. Okay, physical pollution. Um, I'm going to quickly whirl through this for the sake of time, so we have plenty of time to get onto the Q&A. You guys know how bad it is in terms of litter pollution. I'm sure you've walked along the coast and you found bits of plastics and fishing gear, whatever else it might be. Um, you've probably heard this fact too, that by 2050, there will be more plastic in the fish than, sorry, there'll be more plastic in the ocean than fish, which is very, very scary. Um, and just to say every year, we know that 1 million birds and 100,000 marine mammals die purely down to marine litter pollution. So when we do say reduce, re reuse, recycle, we really, really mean it. Um, this is a picture actually of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And in 2018, it was three times the size of France. That is the scale of this problem. Um, and then chemical pollution. So um, we can't think about chemical pollution without unfortunately thinking about our orcas. Um, so our West Coast community of orcas in Scotland, um, we actually only have eight individuals um, now. We have four males and four females. Um, they've been recorded only in the UK in Irish waters. Um, they're quite distinguishable. Um, you know, there's lots of photo ID being done. You can actually recognize specific individuals. Um, but one of the big problems that this population has faced is due to chemical pollu pollution. So um, PCBs in particular. Um, so PCBs um, were a material that were used in things like paints, electrical equipment, sealants. Um, and while uh, the, the um, manufacturing of products with PCBs has been banned, we still have a lot leaking into our environment. Um, and we actually know that according to the Stockholm Convention, about 14 million tonnes of PCB still hasn't been disposed of safely. 
Um, so unfortunately, this has accumulated through bioaccumulation in these orcas, in these large marine predators, built up in their fat and in their blubber and um, causing really, um, really sort of negative effects for their health and um, inability to reproduce. Um, yeah, just very bad, unfortunately, for, for our orcas. Um, OK, I'm going to try and bring the tone up a little bit and make sure we have time for questions. <laughs> I realise it's a heavy topic, so thank you for sticking with me for it. Um, if you'd like to actually come along and see some marine mammals, I definitely recommend getting out to Montrose Basin Visitor Centre. So I was there just last weekend and we were watching a grey seal and a harbour seal kind of just chilling out um, from the visitor centre window, which was amazing. Um, we saw some otters and other lots of seabirds as well. Um, so definitely recommend getting there. And um, we also have online, we have our adopt a seal um, we have a uh, plastic free adoption packs, which make quite a nice gift. And um, so do check that out. Um, we're going to have some events on as well this year. So we have um, the Sea Scotland conference happening um, in, uh, sorry, in June and the actual conference is in June um, in Edinburgh. Um, tickets have just become available, so we will share a link to that for you. Um, it's a really great space to come together. It's for everyone who has an interest in the marine environment. Um, if you work in the marine environment, you care about it, come along and learn more about the big conversations going on. Um, and we have a youth event as well in April, um, which we'll share as well. Um, so yeah, I'm going to end there. Thank you so much for listening and let's get it stuck into the Q&A. Great, thank you so much, Eloise. Um, yeah, we've got we do have one more poll question. I don't know if you wanted to still do that or if you want to just head straight into the Q and A. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, yeah. Well, here it is anyway. Yeah, I think it's quite a quick one. If people want to, um, want to give it a wee bash, would you support increased protection for marine mammals? I'll close my eyes as the answers come in. <laughs> Yeah, looks like a resounding yes. So that's great. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so thank you again to all of our speakers. We'll head straight in in the last 10 minutes into our uh, Q&A. So I can see that a couple of questions have been answered uh, throughout the talks, but we still have a couple. Um, so we have one for Carol. Um, so in your experience and over your career, how have you seen citizen science change research approaches, e.g. questions you're able to address and the understanding you're able to answer when citizen science is incorporated into projects from the outset? So are you happy to take that one? Yeah, it is a great question. And I've been, I saw it come up um, quite early on and I've been racking my brains to try and think of real changes in approaches or real changes in questions that we've, we've had as a result of information that we've got. Um, and I've been struggling a little bit, but I think what what I would say is that that technology and the availability of certain technology has really revolutionised the scope um, of citizen science data. So I think just simply mobile phones, but everyone now has their own kind of data collection device in their pockets that can get locations, photographs. Um, and information about what they've seen and that can be shared in apps and that the app development has just that's revolutionized the way in which we can collate and collect information um, and I think just you know as cameras get better and as more and more people are out and about the advent of drones I think has also got the potential to revolutionize um, our research I think although there are um, issues related to drone use and concerns about the potential for disturbance and getting too close to animals um, but carefully kind of done and under kind of guidance such as the, you know, the kind of equivalent to the, to the WISE um, and the, the Scottish Marine Wildlife Watching Code, um, then we can make a real benefit from, from those kind of technologies and the accessibility of those kind of technologies. The um, EcoPreds project I mentioned, I don't think we would have um, got half the information and data that we've managed to collect over the last couple of years without collaborating with local drone operators to collect some really amazing footage on, or, uh, on orca and seal interactions and just kind of orca group behavior, et cetera. So yeah, I would say that's probably where things I'm seeing kind of being revolutionary, 
revolutionized in terms of citizen science. It doesn't Thank quite you. maybe answer the question, but it's <laughs> my take on it. It's a, it is a big question, isn't it? I don't know, uh, Kate, if you want to jump in on any any points on that one as well. Yeah, I mean, I think for us at Orca, we've always been, you know, a huge advocate of citizen science. And I think what's changed for us, you know, even over the past few years is the recognition of the contributions of citizen scientists. Um, you know, most, the data that we use is, you know, our citizen scientists are highly trained. So whether you join us as an ocean watcher or as a marine mammal surveyor, you have to go through a training course, which means that we can we can ensure that the data is really robust. So I think for me, it's, yeah, the accessibility that Carol said, you know, having the Ocean Watchers app on your phone is just incredible. The fact that there are so many different ways you can get involved easily, but also, you know, testing the data sets and showing the, their robustness has made a massive, massive difference. And I think we'll continue to get more and more people involved in citizen science, which is which is great. Great, thank you. Um, so just looking through some of the questions. Um, so there's a question here about the West Coast Community Orca. Um, so I think potentially Carol, if you would, that would be best for you. I'm trying to think um, if, if it's still considered that there are eight West Coast Community Orca surviving, or is that in the absence of evidence that most are deceased? I think I'd have to pass on that one. It's not something that I'm. <laughs> I think Ellie is Kate, Kate looks like she's jumping to answer. Okay, Grand. Um, so from the research that I've seen, and like you know, it's not research that Orca have done personally, but from the research that I've seen, the numbers are still estimated to be eight, but it is suspected that there are only two left. So that's obviously John Cohen Aquarius, who are the the kind of infamous um, infamous two that we've seen all over the UK last year. I think they went on a, a little UK tour uh, last year and were seen sort of everywhere. Um, so the well, the official numbers are still eight. Um, it's suspected that unfortunately it could just be the two males left. Yeah, and they're so heavily polluted, um, you know, they're completely, uh, you know, even if there were some males and some females, they're unable to reproduce, you know, the population, unfortunately, is is a, is a dying one, which is really, really sad. Um, and uh, it was Lulu when, um, when she died, and the sort of uh, autopsy was done on her, and it showed how much waste she had accumulated in her fatty tissue. Um, as much that it was not it was the case where um, you know if she had washed up she washed up obviously, obviously on the coast but it was she was deemed as toxic waste that is how polluted she was so it's sad it's a sad story um, we actually have a question I think I think for you Eloise on bycatch uh, deaths so the number of cetacean bycatch deaths where where that number comes from um if that was maybe Sorry, a statistic yeah. on one of your slides. Yeah, sure. So um, what I'd say as well is um, we do all the further reading links we've been sharing, we're going to include in the YouTube video once this gets uploaded. So um, I'll make a note to include a link to um, some bycatch figures because I'm sure that we can find something that's probably, um, you know, even more um, up to date than the figures that I was using, which were published from 2021. Um, so yeah, leave that with me. But um, in terms of, it, it's really difficult to monitor, right? Because um, when it comes to bycatch, uh, you know, trying to understand, you know, um, sort of, you know, the, the, the reason for the death and actually like if it's being reported, you know, like um, some some sort of fisheries might not actually go through the official reporting process if they, um, they do that. So it's a difficult one. We can we often say at least this many, this number of cetaceans or at least this number because we can never really know without better monitoring, unfortunately. Great. Thank you, Eloise. Um, so we have a follow up question in one of the questions that was answered um, through through a, a typed uh, answer. So that this is for uh, you, I think, Carol, on uh, grey seals and harbour seals. So um, just as a follow up to one of your answers, does this mean that grey seal predation on harbour seals is relatively new? If so, could this be a consequence of overfishing slash lack of other prey species? Yeah, that's another really good question. Um, I think we're certainly seeing it more than we ever used to, but whether that means it just didn't occur and we didn't see it before um, is, is a really good question. That's one of the 
the things that, that we're looking into. Um, Izzy, the PhD student who's leading on this, this project, she's been looking at um, strandings records um, going a lot further back to see if we could reassess any of those cases that maybe at the time weren't attributed to predation, but maybe now that we know what they look like in terms of what the what, what the patterns on the carcass look like, um, to see if it did actually occur a lot further back in the past. So we'll hopefully be able to provide more of an answer to that soon. But it certainly does appear to be more common now than it used to be. Um, what's causing it and whether it's a consequence of, of a lack of, of prey, that's a really hard question to answer. And I don't think we're in a position to answer it at the moment. Um, it's certainly, it only seems to be, all the observations have only been of kind of male, large male gray seals. Um, and they don't eat all of the seal, though they do partially consume some of the seal. So we're really unsure what's driving the behavior, whether it really is about you know food and, and um, consumption or whether it's something else that's going on. Um, yeah, lots of great questions, not necessarily all the answers yet. And thank you. Uh, so I think we'll squeeze we'll squeeze the last two in just right at the end there. Um, so we've had two questions quite similar in terms of ways to help. So somebody saying I saw more plastic than wildlife when I rode the Atlantic five years ago. I'm passionate uh, to become a marine mammal surveyor um, and book to see safari. How else can I accelerate my progress to help? And somebody else saying so many ways for us as individuals to get involved. If you could only pick one of them, what would it be? So I guess I'll just throw that open to all the speakers. What, yeah, what would be the the one big thing that you would advocate? I know that's really difficult, but <laughs> we'll try and do it. Um, I could go first if you want. Um, this is a question I get quite a lot. Um, for me, it's use your voice um, in whatever capacity that is. So whether that is you are able to use your voice as a citizen scientist collecting data, maybe you're inland, use your voice to contact policymakers, use your voice with, with industry, um, you know, showing them that you don't want products that are made of plastic, that, you know, of new plastic, you want products that are made from recycled materials or not plastic at all. Um, that would be the big thing um, for me, just to quickly, um, the person who asked about how can they accelerate their progress? First of all, thank you so much for supporting us. It's really, really amazing you're doing so. Um, by booking on the Ocean Washers course, you're already doing amazingly. So um, get on the course, um, enjoy the course, get out there, collect some data, use your voice as a citizen scientist. Um, and yeah, it, it, you can, you've got a lot of power as people. So yeah, definitely use it. Great, thank you, Kate. Um, anyone else want to jump in or we'll we just leave it there? I don't think there's anything I could add to that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, get involved wherever and however you can in whatever capacity you're able to and, and using your voice um, and, and telling others about your passions and what you care about um, and what are the things affecting it. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would I would definitely agree with all of that and, and say that, you know, sometimes the problem seems so massive. You think, what can I do? It's really overwhelming. Um, it is, and it's okay to admit that. Um, I think uh, my my advice would be um, that you know it's it's fantastic to talk about these issues. Of course it is, but you know the scale of the problem now is that conversations aren't quite enough. We really need we really need action. We need people to do something, and it doesn't matter if you feel that oh this is just one litter pick. Um, you know one time in my local park. What's that going to do? Anything you can do will make a difference for our planet, for nature. Whether it's you know the way that you you know sort of shop or um as a consumer and um, get just think think about something you care about like just try find one little thing and feel like you know and, and, and try and like explore how you can action that change but yeah great thank you Eloise yeah so I think yeah I think just any any action big or small um you know you'll be making a difference no matter what it is and yeah lots of great op opportunities and um options that we've popped in the chat from our speakers uh, this evening to sort of get you started and thinking about what what you might want to do um so yeah thanks again very much to our speakers tonight so carol uh, kate and eloise were just a few minutes over um but we just want to squeeze those last questions questions in there so thanks so much again for joining us uh, tonight and to all of you for listening 
Um, again, as I said, there are there will be um, the webinars on our Scottish Wildlife Trust YouTube channel to look back on and watch again. Um, so go and check those out. Um, and I think we will leave it there and let you guys get on with your evenings. But again, thank you so much um, for joining us and a, a great end to the webinar series as well. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm just going to end the recording, all right?